So um, I'm Owen Taylor. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am work at Red Hat. I um, have my role as the architect for our workstation efforts. That means that I mostly do a lot of both planning tasks and coordination between workstation and Red Hat's server products, and do some more things on the um, Fedora side. So um, my title of my talk may be competing for the most um, obscure title of the conference, <laughs> but it, so its talk is what's Fedora's alternative to vihttpd.conf. So what I'm really going to be talking about is how we move from the old-fashioned way of doing development, the way of doing development that was a good idea when it was amazing that you had this, this Linux computer that was just like a server, but it was on your desk, and to uh, a more modern way of doing development that really makes sense in the new world of containers and virtual machines when you don't really have to have your workstation and your server be exactly the same thing. And how can we take advantage of that? Um, so I want to start off to, oh, um, did I have it like, okay, I, that's one second here while I switch. Um, Let's see. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so I want to talk a little bit first. It's about how Fedora is for developers, because this is all about making Fedora better for developers. And I think you could say that Fedora is great for developers. Let's if you look at develop, the Fedora Developer Portal is a new effort. It has a lot of great information about um, about what's available for Fedora. And you look at it, you see we have all these different languages available. And not only do we have this packaging available, but it's very quickly updated. Every six months, there's a new version of Fedora out with new versions of all these different languages and all the different libraries that go along with it. And it's not just, and it's not just um, languages, it's tools. We have you know, Docker and Vagrant and Word Builder and all these things you can use to set up your development environment and do different things. Um, On the other hand, Fedora is awful for developers. We have all these different software available. If one gets started, you say, well, what do I start with? Um, we, we're going to say, it's on the same level, we show you Python, and we show you Go, and we show you Elixir. And what, what do I start off with? We have all these different tools. We have, um, you know, do we use Docker? Do we use Vagrant? Do we use Vert Builder? We're not giving any recommendations there. We Every six months, we do an update with new versions of all the software. So if I want the next version of Python, well, I need to upgrade my, my desktop to the new version. And what if, what if some version project I'm working on wants the old version of Python? Then I have to choose to upgrade or not to choose to upgrade. That's not a very good situation. We really don't want our version of our tools to be bound to our, the desktop I'm running and have to, if I need a new, new version of Python, I shouldn't have to do a system upgrade. And even though we update every six months, that's still not fast enough. A new version of Node.js comes out, it might be six months until you get to use that new version on Fedora. So um, that's not so good. Um, and you know, one of the advantages we say of Fedora that I didn't mention is that we don't really bind you to any web service. We're not trying to sell you any online, you know, we're not saying, we're not AWS, we're not Google App Engine. If you develop for Fedora, you're developing using all these open tools. But on the other hand, uh, you get to the end of the day and you write the coolest new application on Fedora. How do you get it, you get it out to your users? We don't provide any help there. You have to then figure that all out for yourself. Um, so um, just um, since I'm talking about development, development can mean a lot of different things. So I just wanted to quickly say what I'm talking about here. And what I'm really talking about is web development, server development, backend development. Um, this is you know, a large chunk of the development market. And it's also really where open source is strongest. 
this is a world in where open source tools have a great deal of mind share. Um, you know, there are other important types of development. I think one other thing we see important in Fedora is sensitive computing and big data. That's um, definitely something people do. It's not necessarily writing an application for other people. It's often writing an application and writing code for yourself, playing around with data. Um, native, native application development is also very important. It's not like there are a lot of people sitting out there writing native apps for Linux or especially GNOME apps for Linux, but those are the apps that make our desktop work really well, that make it compelling. So we need to support that. And I'm not really going to talk about that, but we're doing a lot of work in the workstation to support that with, we're working on GNOME Builder, Flatpaks really make this a whole lot better. And some of the same principles that I'm going to talk about here are, are found in that work, but um, it's a little bit separate. Fedora has a lot of people doing low level development, they're doing the kernel, they're doing the system data development. That already works pretty well. I'm not gonna say we should change how we do that. Um, you know, then there are types of development that um, maybe there are lo we have less influence over. If someone's doing a mobile app development, they're probably using you know, the tool provided by Apple or by Google, and we can't really make that better or worse, it's just what it is. And you know, game development is a thing of its own. So, and we, this is not comprehensive, there's IoT and so forth, but I, the main takeaway here is I'm really talking about the server-side development because that's where we should have our biggest presence and where we need to, we can make things better for people. So the old school development was the vihttpd.conf, where I just start, start up my editor, I start editing config files in my system, you know, I see what, see what happens with that. But what, is, what does modern development mean to me? Modern development means that your development environment is not your workstation environment necessarily. You're going to use a container or a virtual machine, so you have a development environment which is isolated from your workstation. And I can, if I want to develop for CentOS on Fedora, I can do that. If I want to develop for Fedora 25 on Fedora 24, I can do that. And I have this, um, you know, I can cleanly separate that out. Flatpak is a different way of separating that out that really applies to more to desktop applications where we say the runtime for Flatpak is different from your desktop runtime. Um, your um, development environment should be reproducible. Um, you shouldn't have to spend days setting up your workstation or a VM in the right way to come get something to compile and then have to, if you need to reset that again, start over from scratch. You should actually have recorded exactly what you needed to do to set up your development environment. Hopefully that's very simple and you get going. And in fact, hopefully that development environment is actually recorded in your Git repository. It's part of your project's configuration um, so that everybody can be using the same development environment. I think anybody who has worked on a significant open source project has found that one of the hardest problems of getting newcomers to in is getting them getting them going on development environment. How do they get the, your software to build? Why is it working differently on their machine than your machine? Um, you know, we, with GNOME, we spent many years creating GH build into a system to try to make everybody's development environment um, enough alike by installing system packages, by rebuilding things. Um, and generally, you know, if I'm actually working on a server application, <coughs> Every, everybody, regardless of what operating system they're using on their desktop, should be able to use the same development environment. And often that same development environment is going to be what you're used for testing and even what you're going to use for de deployment. It's, versions can be the same across all of those. That's what we can really have in a, that's what we can have these days. So um, now I'm sort of changing gears just a bit. I wanted to go back to this idea of we've all how we're displaying so much choice to developers on Fedora. We're displaying all these different options, and why should we narrow that down a bit? Why should we pick up, figure out what's the golden path for developers? Well, you know, one thing is that having this diversity is here is good, but that's really putting a lot of um, responsibility on the newcomer, the person who's coming into Fedora and says, "I want to create a web app." We're saying, well, there's pros and cons to all of these. Go research this on the internet. 
and figure out what you want to do. That's, you know, if we have opinions, we think that things, some things work better, we think some things are more free software, then we really have the responsibility to make a recommendation. We shouldn't just say, it's all good, you figure it out. Um, we also have the case that we don't really know how our users are, are developing with Fedora, so we can't actually have good tests for it. We, um, when somebody comes in and says, I have a, hit this problem, somebody will probably tell them to use something different. Say you're, you use Fedora, you try to use Vagrant on it. Um, you hit a problem, somebody says, oh, you're using the libvirt backend to Vagrant. Yeah, I, the VirtualBox one works better, why don't you try using that instead? And we, since we don't say which one is really our standard, we're like, yeah, okay, there's some problems there, people can work around them. Well, instead we should know what, what do we, are we are recommending people use Vagrant? Are we recommending people use Vagrant with libvirt? Then we better make sure that works out of the box. So if we know what our paths are, we can really make sure that they work well, and not only work well, we can make sure that they work slickly. We can make our tools, our documentation, um, center around certain paths that we think work well and provide a really nice experience. Instead of saying, here's a terminal, here's a list of packages you can install with DNF, have fun. So I'm just um, thinking about decisions. Not only do we have to know like, why should we make them, we have to know how we should make them. And I guess there's two points I'll say there. One is that we def I'm not saying we should have no choices. I think it's very reasonable to somebody coming in to say, I want to program in Python, I want to pro program in JavaScript, give me different recommendations about how to do that. Um, but you can't have too many choices. You can't have to choose your, if you're saying first choose your language, and then choose your development environment, then choose which database you're going to use with it, then choose this and then choose that, we're going to basically, we lost any sense that we're actually able to provide a curated experience. So we, we want to provide a small, finite set of choices. And then within that, we need to engage the communities um, to tell us what the best upstream practices are. We really um, should be going to people say developing with um, Python on Fedora and say, well, how do people do Python development? How do we code that into our tools? What's the best way of setting an environment for Python? And the same way with Node.js or Rust or whatever other project we're working on. Because we can't invent entirely new different ways of doing things on Fedora. In, in the end, Fedora is not the right place for somebody to ask you know, a question about a uh, compilation error they're running with, into with Rust. We can't have our Fedora specific way of doing Rust. We need to make sure people can go to the upstream community and say, I'm having this problem, and then have that make sense. So we need to basically figure out what the best upstream practices are and build our sort of golden paths around that. Um, and then, you know, if we are saying, okay, there are certain develop ways of developing that we're promoting, well, what about everybody who develops this different way? <coughs> well, you know, one thing I'd say is that we need to make whatever we're doing extensible and generally um, flexible so that you can work as you're used to, but use our tools when they make sense. Um, but we shouldn't be to the point of saying extensibility means that anybody can add to our set of options. We shouldn't feel that just because somebody has figured out how to use our tools with Elixir and has blogged about that, then we have to offer Elixir as a top level language of choice. I'm picking on Elixir because uh, it was on the developer project.org and I had not heard of it before, but maybe that's the new hot thing and it's good if you are an Elixir developer, I apologize. Um, so, um, and then, I mean, as I said, if we pick our paths, we can clear road roadblocks. I think we know some of the roadblocks people typically hit on Fedora. Um, networking with virtual machines can be a real pain. You can, um, there's different constraints if you're running as um, libert as a system or as a user, and um, often that can be a real pain point. Um, we know that permissions and SQL can be hard for new users. And some of this is just um, a question of um, documentation. Like if you, there's um, in Docker now, if you want to mount a volume under Fedora, there's a special option you can add to the mount to say, fix up the SE Linux permissions. 
this is great. This is it's a really nice thing that was added. But if you don't know about it, you're going to have a world of pain until you find it somewhere deep in the man page. And then, but mostly what I'm going to talk about here is how to create a slick experience around um, development on Fedora. And so if you were at the last talk, you saw uh, Richard Hughes talk about things he's been working on for five years that he's worked through with, develop, with the designers and have gone through many iterations. I'm on the hand going to be showing some demos of stuff that I spent about three days on. So um, this is not necessarily um, anything that's going to move forward, but it's um, basically just showing off my, some of my ideas in code. So the first thing I want to say is that we need to have tools that have just enough smarts and just enough knowledge of our conventions to be able to work effectively with people's projects. Um, so the first thing I'm going to show off is something that I've called for working purposes FedM, which is basically a tool that understands uh, common project conventions. So um, up here. So say I have <coughs> a little bit bigger even. Okay. So here we have a little. Um, I think I'm actually going to move the recording stream to look at the screen and set and see if that. Because <laughs> I don't think it would make much sense with it, just be talking. But um, we have um, a little Python program. And if you know Python and you see a directory called VNs inside a Python project, you're saying, okay, that's probably a Python virtual environment. It's one of multiple commands people use for setting up virtual environments under Python, but it's a somewhat recognized one. So, and well, how would you activate that environment if you were? You know, if you know that you would source bin, vn, bin, oops, source bin, vn, bin activate. That's something that somebody who's worked with Python probably understands. Um, but since, you know, we can, our tooling can understand that connection too. So, so if you fed, fed m shell, that brings up a, a shell. A, this is a few things. It changes the prompt to say, I'm working on the whole Python project. Um, it, okay. If it added the VN bin to the path there, so now if I type Python, I get the localized Python, which uses the local versions of the libraries. Um, and, you know, I think the only other thing it does here is if it changes, it sets an alias for CD, so if I CD somewhere, else, and I hit CD, it goes back to the project home instead of my home. But it's really a very simple tool, and by itself is probably not all that interesting. That is, um, if you're working on Python, you probably figure out how to use um, virtual environments, and there are Python-specific tooling, like um, AutoEnv, to do similar things in a way that all people recognize. But the nice thing about this is if we start building up conventions, saying that our projects live in under pro capital P projects and um, that um, they're set up in a way that FedEd recognizes them and build higher level tools that work on that. So I wrote a little graphical program called, again for working purposes, new term that basically understands this project structure. So if I go to the activities overview now and I search for hello Python, I get a search result coming from new term, the second search result is just from my terminal, but, um, and then if I turn there, it opens up on my other monitor, so I'll, let me drag this across, and then I have a, little, a terminal here, um, you know, this is, um, we see here, it, it knew that it was starting up into a project directory, so it internally runs fed, fed env, and now it has, you know, okay, I don't, uh, has a path set up, I, probably a little bit hard to read here, but it has the um, path set up as before. Um, if I create, you know, if I create a new tab here, it's also going to have the same path set up. And one thing I did is, while the, some of the prompt information didn't have to be stuffed in the prompt, now that I had nowhere terminal there, so the project name is up in the left-hand corner instead of being stuffed into my path. Um, and then, you know, I'll demo a few more things that this does later on in this talk here. But the basic idea is that now we've 
we made it um, navigation um, part of the um, desktop, something that's aware of it, because we have an app that actually knows about projects, and it can then show up in the activity search. Well, if I just had terminals and Gnome Shell doesn't understand anything about a terminal, and, and definitely doesn't understand about what you're running inside the terminal. And if I have a different project here, I have a push. Okay. Here's, this is another project um, here that I have in the same, my, my capital P projects directory. And this is a Node.js um, project, and just to demonstrate that it's, that we can be a little bit more general, by echo uh, path in here, we see that it knew that, and that for Node.js directory, that under node modules slash dot bin, that's what you need to have in your path. So it knew how to set up something different for a Node.js application. Um, so, okay. Um, so that's um, part of the solution here. I'm talking about that we understand projects, we understand how to set things up, we understand how to bring that into the desktop. But I haven't really gone to the other part of what I was talking about, which is the idea that your that um, your that your development environment is not your workstation environment. I mean, Python virtual end sort of solves it a bit. It means I have a different set of, of packages there, but it doesn't really address the question of saying, what if I want a different version of Python? What if I want a different version of Node.js? Um, so um, the other thing that, other trick that FedAMS knows is how to set up a container quickly with a different set of packages and, and get you into that container. So let's get out of, so that's, I'm going to do this in the normal terminal so it's clear what I'm doing. So let's see. So, so we say, I'm going to start with um, Fedora 24 and packages. We'll want Node.js. So I'll, I'll put it in there. Just a very simple file which says that I want to use a Start with the Fedora 24 Docker image and also include the Node.js package. Then, see that? What's that? Now, but now if I do one set of shell, it, before this would have just said, okay, it's a Node.js project, let's set up using system packages. But now that it sees that Fedora YAML there, it created uh, a, a little Docker file that the appropriate contents and it said, okay, um, okay, I'm actually going to scroll up a little bit on there too. See what it did. It installed some some basic tools like Git and Less in there. Then it installed the package I listed there, and then it added myself inside the package there, inside the container, and then gave me a shell inside the container. So um, this was very very fast because it was cached. That was uh, I had done it previously. It, could, it would take starting from scratch probably in about a couple of minutes if you had to download the images maybe more if on the conference network. Um, so see, so where am I now? Actually, I'm not in my home directory. I'm actually in slash projects angular phone cat. It's been down in there inside the container. Um, if I do uh, RPM QA, if I do, oh, I only have 213 packages installed. So clearly I have a much smaller and cleaner package set than my workstation would show. Um, and And you know, basically, I just have a fully working environment there, and I could um, have used a different version of Fedora. I could have used CentOS instead of Fedora, and it would have given me a different type of development environment. And I think as we go forward with Fedora and modularity, we'll see that there's more ability to say that I want, you know, when the next version of Node.js is, is um, released, I'll immediately be able to get that from Fedora and. We will probably be breaking up the um, Fedora tempo a little bit so that we're, we don't have the problem that you necessarily have to wait for the next version of Fedora to get the next version of software. So I think even more you'll be able to pick the version of the software you want. 
but already by just saying that I can get an environment without having to um, change things on my, my workstation, I've made a big step forward. And this actually becomes a lot more important with Atomic Workstation, where we're saying that our image for the system is actually a fixed image. RPM layering gives you some ability to get around that, say I'm going to install something on top of the standard Atomic Workstation image, but it has the basic limitation of, of losing some of the advantages of Atomic Workstation. As soon as you start installing new, new packages on top of your works, Atomic Workstation image, then it, you no longer know that it's going to upgrade cleanly. You, know, you have some, and it gets a lot more complicated. So this is meant to be a way that will work both existing Fedora and with um, future versions of, it, of Fedora where we have a fixed base image and apps layered on top. This is a way of layering a Fedora development environment on top. Okay. So, so that's sort of how you work with an existing project. We also want to talk about, you know, also want to provide ways of starting a new project. And, you know, I think this is, the idea of a new project wizard is pretty well established. We had it with developer assistant, assistant and um, I, I want to show off <coughs> what it looks like in GNOME Builder just to sort of show what the uh, GNOME state of the art is around that. Um, so if you, if you run GNOME Builder, you see it offers you to, you know, one of, either use one of your current projects or you can create a new project and says offers to you create a project from a directory on your computer or from a Git repository or from a template. And then you have your choice of, you know, you pick your, you name your project. And then, but you pick your, what language is in. But right now, Builder offers a, it's a very small set of templates which are very much oriented around GNOME development. So, I, I don't know yet whether if we're doing something that's not our own development, whether we actually want to use the, the builder code base or to replicate um, the same sort of um, interface for for um, command line projects. But um, this is sort of the kind of interface that I'd eventually see having. Right now, I'm just going to demo this um, creating a new project from the command line. Very much. Um, let's close. Close those. Here, so um, very much simple. Um, I'm just going to say fedm create Django my Django project. Why do I call it Django site just for fun? Okay. Um, if I spell it right, it would. That shows that there's no actual template system. There's just one hard coded template there. Um, so, goes ahead and does a bunch of stuff. It sets up the the um, containerized environment. Okay, now it's actually sets a virtual environment, and then it's going to run the sort of Django setup um, tool. And then if I my Django right side, I can bring it up in the terminal here, and then you know it has. So a skeleton Django setup there. It has a virtual environment, um, and it's all set up for me. Um, but the the thing here is, this is the same setup you get if you follow the Django tutorial from the website. We're not creating a, a new way of doing Django projects. At this point, you could just go ahead and follow the Django tutorial straight through, and it would all work. And if I do Oh, uh, wait, I already currently have something. Okay, uh, okay. okay this is demo of fact. <laughs> Yeah, I just don't know the offhand know the option to change. Run server zero, uh, 
Let me go back to the wing again. Okay, and okay, is that port forwarded from the no, Well, the I was going to demo here. Uh, I uh, oh, like take Control C here. Yeah. So, uh, right. And so one thing I just points out here is that. It's not a, it's actually the, because it's for development and because we want what shows up in the Django tutorial to just work, the container is actually sharing the same, um, the host networking. It does not, it's not using a separate networking thing because generally that, that basically creates a divergence between what people expect upstream and what you'd actually have and you'd have to know what the IP of the container was. Um, and that, you know, that's, um, Pretty straightforward, and you could do that whether or not you have um, the all the packages installed on your host system or not, <coughs> and you could do it with any version of Django that's um, available in Fedora. So that's essentially the answer, you know, in very rough sketch of what my uh, the question in my my talk title presents is that we want to be doing things in containers, we want to be doing things like upstream, and we want to have tools that make it slick and straightforward to do that. Um, now, this is, gets you sort of started, but we actually need to provide the user support from end to end. We can't just say that we're going to get you started with a project and then leave you off. And this is where I think that we've, why Dev Assistant never really um, caught on. Because Dev Assistant was something that was very useful to create a template, to create an initial project there, but it didn't offer anything to an experienced user. So there was no reason to actually engage with Dev Assistant unless you didn't know anything about um, about getting started. Once you actually knew the the tools that were behind Dev Assistant, it became a little bit unnecessary overhead. And the idea here is to instead create tools that actually are useful for experienced developers, for people who already know what they're doing. Um, and you know that's um, often going to be by actually providing the necessary bits of user interface within the application, within the term application, to let you move forward in, the, in useful ways. And this is a sort of a quickly mocked example of that. Um, so, so if I do a get init here, get add um, ML, manage set pi, and my okay. Now I see over here, it note the um, terminal program noted that this is a get project. It's figured out on the master branch. Um, if I get check out dash b, some fix, create a new branch, that will notice the change for the branch there. So that's providing us a little bit of new interface. Again, this is something that most people have set up if they know how in their prompt. But that's another, you know, you have to find somebody saying, telling you, how do you set up your prompt for Git? Okay, did you do that correctly? Then you have to get prompt, and then there's only so much you can stuff into the prompt. I mean, at some point your prompt string becomes like a half a mile long. Um, and I, you know, similarly we could do things that, for instance, if you have a, you actually have a more production Docker image that you're using to test your application set up there, we could um, provide the status of that in the user interface or um, basically anything that's sort of useful contextual, contextual information about the project we can provide within the terminal user interface and not just require everybody to do it by stuffing things into the prompt. Um, but, I, but again, it's not a question of did you have to go out and use an external Git tool to get this. We're trying to work within how people are working within a terminal because we're basically creating better ways of um, working within a terminal but we should also integrate well with the external tools when they exist. So maybe next to this is a button to launch git, git g on the same directory there, and you know if you want the graphical view. So um, you know then we're proceeding on from here, we have to continue um, um, 
continue on sort of the introducing the best practices there. So how do you package up your application for deployment? You know, are we using a Docker file? Do we want to, is OpenShift something interesting for Fedora? We have to figure that out. We have to provide the ways to make it easy for people to take those steps there. And then, you know, I guess I'll leave this open question, but as a final question, we're not done until the user's app is actually deployed someplace. So just having a development solution um, isn't enough. We actually have to know what are we recommending for deployment? Are we telling people that you need to install a Fedora server someplace? Are we telling people that you know you should write OpenShift application and find some provider who is offering hosting for that or some other format? I think it's a um, it's a very hard question because Fedora doesn't sell anything. We don't provide any web services, but you know I think it is um, something we always have to keep in mind in recommending how you create your application is how you're eventually going to deploy it. And there might just be multiple answers depending on you know on what you're interested in, but there has to be some answer there. So um, that's basically what I wanted to talk about today. Um, so you know you can find me on Fedora Workstation if these kind of things interest you. Um, or email me, um, and I guess at this point I'd ask for any questions or comments people have. Yeah, you? Okay. <laughs> yeah. How much of this, I mean, most of it doesn't look GNOME dependent, but some of it looks, you have the terminal starting and the things, yeah. and that's, that's not really a, GNOME dependent thing, is it? Well, okay, so what's GNOME dependent here? I mean, clearly the underlying command line tool has nothing to do with G right. GNOME. Um, but the, the application that I'm running there, this new term as I call mm -hmm. it, is design, is intended to be designed according to GNOME that guidelines that fit well into the GNOME desktop. Okay. It should be certainly runnable under KDE or XFCE as well. It might not be quite as slick. I mean, it provides the GNOME shell search provider if you're you know, GNOME, so you can search for things in the shell. Um, but I mean, I think probably you get a lot of the benefits under any desktop. Okay. You just might get a little bit of mis mismatching UI. Well, yeah, it doesn't have a title box. Well, I mean, it, it would come up with the title bar if if you if ran it under would. XFC, it would come up with a, a minimal title bar, I think. If, um, it depends a little bit. I mean, it, it depends upon whether GDK thinks that your application will be able to run something without a separate title bar, and whether um, the application is using the, if the application is using the app menu to display okay. important things, and that will open a menu bar. Yeah. So I mean, you know, we do pay attention in within the GK project to being able to make apps that that adapt between different desktops, um, and you know that if, that can be. Require some app support, but I definitely would expect that it would work. Right. Like like GNOME software will work on any desktop. This will work on any desktop. It may, but it's using the GNOME design language, or it would eventually use the GNOME design language now instead of uh, whatever I hacked up in two days. Yeah. So, how would you market this to developers and get their mind share? Because I think that system was a great attempt, and yeah. somehow I see it slowly died off. So I mean, I think, so Dev Assistant, you know, I mean, I think there is a couple of things that hindered Dev Assistant. One is I think just basically that it didn't really offer much to somebody who already knew what they were doing. You know, it basically was, you know, I don't know how to check out the package from GitHub, or I can use Dev DA tweak GitHub or whatever. And so, so we basically said, if you don't know what to do, you can figure out the dev assistant command line, or you can figure out the sort of native command line. And that wasn't necessarily a win. So it had a lot of knowledge about projects, but it was all pushed out to the part, so was the starting area. So that's one sort of thing I think hindered dev assistant. And I think also the, the UI never got as much attention and love as the command line. And I think that means that we didn't have a lot of cool you know, videos dem demonstrating Dev Assistant. You know, I think, you know, basically my idea for promoting this would basically to, you know, make it slick, you know, make it work, make it be actually useful for people, make sure that we get enough some testing among ourselves to make sure that it's actually something that we should be promoting, you know, and then, then you know, go out and you know, tell, tell people about how it makes your life as a developer better. 
you know, and how it's, um, and I think that, you know, I think it can be a, a powerful message, I mean, just to show people. Um, I think there's often this sort of dichotomy between terminal and design, that is, your design either entirely within the terminal based upon command line options, or you design the user interface, um, and I think that that's not a, a dichotomy that we really need to have, that especially on Fedora, where the terminal and the separate development is very much what we're focusing around, we can have both. We can have things that are for people who want to work in a terminal that are more than just a terminal. Okay. Yeah? Uh, is this something ready to contribute, or maybe hack on? Or? Um, not really. <laughs> I mean, I can put it up. I mean, I, I'll probably, I, I can definitely put up put up the code up somewhere, and it's <laughs> it's real code. <laughs> There's nobody behind the curtain there, but um, I think basically, I mean, before I'd really say it's ready to contribute to, one thing I'd like I need to do is have some buy-in from the GNOME designers that this is sort of an interesting way to go. On that, and because without that, it's it's basically just my toy project. It's never going to be good. And then the second thing is it I would have to sort of figure out a bit more about naming. I don't think new term is <laughs> a final name for this. Um, so, so th those are sort of the, the, but I mean, I, so I'll try to um, talk to more people like Wadek on the GNOME side to sort of figure out how this works with the GNOME, GNOME, overall GNOME design. Um, and you know, if it, then if that looks good, then I'll probably put it up somewhere and offer for hacking. But I don't, I don't want to jump the gun too much on that, so right now. Okay, well, thanks everybody.